Hi, and welcome everyone watching our stream today. Um, with us in the stream today is Rebecca Lötman Rydorm, uh, and she will give us uh, her best tips and tricks um, surrounding uh, raising capital for uh, uh, startups uh, and likewise. Uh, for those who don't uh, know Rebecca, uh, she has been, uh, for the past seven years, she has worked in venture capital. And uh, right now, she fi we find her as an uh, investment manager at Industrifonden, uh, one of Sweden's most influential uh, VC firms. Uh, Industrifonden has um, invested in startups for over 40 years. Uh, welcome, Rebecca. How are you? Thank you. Great to be here. Um, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, good to hear. Good to hear. Uh, tell us, just in the beginning here, tell us about Industry Fund and uh, what distinguishes you as investors? Sure. Um, well, I guess one thing is that we have been around for over 40 years and we invest in technology, life science and deep tech. So we have quite a wide focus um, and we invest in uh, companies with a Swedish connection uh, wanting to transform and creating really innovative, enabling technologies, um, which I guess is a little bit different from uh, some others. Um, today we have around 600 million euros in about 50 companies, and we invest typically at sort of late seed uh, Series A uh, stage. Uh, anything from one to um, five million euros typically in a first ticket size. And I guess one thing, another thing that makes us a little bit different is that we can follow our investment up till 20 million euros in one single investment. And since we're not a traditional fund structure, we don't have the same sort of exit pressure when the fund needs to close. Of course, we want our investments to exit within the usual sort of five to seven years. But if it doesn't make sense to exit a company, we can have patience and be owners a little bit longer if needed. Uh, and I think some of our most transformative companies that we've invested in, like Click Tech, or, uh, have taken more than 10 years uh, to exit. So that makes us a little bit different. And I guess also the fact that we don't have to fundraise. So we spend all our time with our portfolio companies and looking for new investments. And I think that makes us quite good owners as well. We both have the time and um, uh, the, as well as the, the fund to be able to support our companies. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, really interesting, uh, especially about the patience, with, uh, which I think is really important uh, these days. Um, I, I, mean, I mentioned a bit about your background before we dig into your tips and tricks. Can you tell us more about, uh, about yourself and your background? Um, I guess the past seven years I've worked only in VC and invested in quite a wide range of different kind of companies, but the past couple of years it's been mostly technology companies. Um, my focus has been a little bit towards uh, enterprise software and uh, today I'm covering, well, both sort of enterprise software, but also uh, AI companies and food tech companies, so also quite uh, a wide spectrum of different kind of companies. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've got a master of economics, uh, which actually makes me a little bit odd in my team because we have a team with a lot of uh, engineers and uh, people with research and uh, science backgrounds. Uh, so, uh, but I'm... Uh, Hmm? Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's good. Yeah. You, you should spread out the the, co the the competence in the company. So that's good that you're not like your colleagues then. Uh, yeah. Industry Fonden's uh, investment appetite. Do you think has it uh, been affected by the current crisis that we're in? Well, to be honest, I think any investor is saying that they haven't been affected by the COVID nineteen and is acting completely as normal, normal is probably lying a little bit because of course everyone is affected because our portfolio companies are affected and i think just like we've advised a lot of our portfolio companies to focus a lot on their current customers and make sure they are happy uh we're doing the same uh we're focusing a lot on our current portfolio companies and redoing all all the plans we had for the year in most of our companies and of course that also affects 
go to how much time and uh, we can spend on, on finding new investments. But with that said, I mean, we are still investing and we have done a record number of investments, uh, both in new uh, and current companies the past year. Um, and we will mostly, most likely close one more investment, I think, before the summer. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and re connected to that, what kind of support besides funding uh, do you give uh, provide for those companies you invest in? And well, it varies a little bit. Typically, we take the role of um, a strategic partner, um, taking always a board seat and um, being sort of a bouncing board uh, when it comes to the direction of the company and the strategy. And we try to stay away from operations. We believe that the founders and the management know their company best. So um, they should be able to run their companies without us interfering in stuff we don't know. Um, but we try to as well contribute as much as possible with our network. And I think we have quite an extensive network since we have about 50 companies today in our portfolio with loads of uh, syndicate partners. Uh, and other so good connections from with other investors where we can do good introductions if they're raising their next round as well as using the portfolio and connecting founders within our portfolio so they can help each other with lessons learned and sort of avoiding the mistakes that uh, other companies have made yeah so that's another way we try to contribute yeah yeah, and and uh, regarding lessons learned, uh, with f over 40 years of experience through both good and bad times, uh, through the dot-com yeah. crisis, the financial crisis, how is it similar this time and how does it differ? Well, it's definitely a black swan. It's, it's different. And I guess all crises are different in some ways. Uh, and it's still really hard to know exactly what, uh, what this crisis is going to look like because we're still in the middle of it. Um, but I think there is a couple of things that are a little bit different this time, um, at least comparing to the dot-com uh, crisis, where a lot of the VC investors disappeared and it was really hard to raise capital for years. Um, uh, I think the VC uh, ecosystem and the VC actors we have in Sweden, at least, have a, met more years of experience now and sort of ha are more firmly established uh, with really large, newly raised funds, a lot of them. So it's it feels like the VZ uh, landscape will be able to withstand the crisis a little bit better than the dot-com at least, but that's, I hope so anyway. Uh, and uh, that I hope means that the access to capital for founders will be a little bit better, at least uh, not as bad as the dot-com where about half of the companies uh, disappeared uh, within just, you know, year. Also, so hopefully it will be better this time. But it's hard to know in this crisis how long it will go for. So yeah, uh, who knows? And uncertainty is something that makes all investors nervous, of course. Yeah, of course. Mm. It makes everyone nervous. Anyone nervous. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, so now that we have a more clear picture about the industry fund then and about you, uh, let's head over so to more general questions about funding. Uh, what would you say characterizes a uh, well-prepared um, entrepreneur and what are you looking for? Um, so that's two questions, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so what characterizes a well-prepared entrepreneur? I guess when you really sort of have a truly unique uh, insight in a problem and an outstanding solution, that's something uh, that really shines through when you pitch your company. And that's something we look for, of course, as well, that someone has really understood the problem they're trying to solve and they have have a really well thought through solution uh, and know their market inside and out. So being very knowledgeable in your product and your market is something that's important when pitching. And personally, I'm, I mean, some, some companies think it's super important to have like a very, very strong pitch. And of course you need to be able to get your message across. Um, but for me, you know, being too well polished is not what's gonna, you know, uh, matter in the end. Uh, of course, you need to do a good pitch, but sometimes I think it's almost exaggerated how how um, 
how good a pitch, then you're almost sort of thinking, what are you hiding? <laughs> <laughs> so be prepared, but don't overestimate, uh, you know, having the perfect pitch. Yeah. Do you think, uh, my next question is, what's the most common mistake you know, notice um, with entrepreneurs that approach you? Could that be one of one of the most common mistakes, maybe? Too well prepared. <laughs> well, no, I guess it varies a lot. Uh, but I think one common mistake is not having, having done your research on the investor you're approaching. I get a lot of people approaching us not knowing at all what we're actually investing in. Um, so do your research and, uh, and make sure you know what the investor you're approaching is looking for so you can target uh, and you know, define your adjust your messaging to the investor you're actually talking to. Um, that's important, I think. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> Cur <coughs> currently, many entrepreneurs see their valuations lowered and wonder how much is reasonable to expect. What is your view on this? Yeah, I, I do think we will see an adjustment in valuations. Um, and how much and for how long is really hard to say. Uh, a lot of I think a lot of us are expecting at least this year we will see some valuation adjustment. Um, and I guess just the fact that it's still hard for me to know if international investors will actually have the courage to close deals without traveling here, mm. without being able to do the due diligence on site. And um, the past couple of years, the amount of international investments in the Swedish um, startups have increased significantly. And if that all goes away, of course, there's less capital available suddenly, and uh, that will most likely affect the valuations as well. So uh, I think we should pre be prepared for some, some adjustment in valuation. But to be completely honest and frank, I think it's actually a little bit welcome because We've seen some pretty crazy valuations in companies with quite little traction sometimes. And I think uh, some adjustments might actually be good. <laughs> I guess I'm speaking <laughs> as an investor, you always want uh, slightly lower valuations. But yeah, I think it's uh, good for the entrepreneurs as well, because it puts a lot of pressure on a company. If your valuation is enormous, there's a lot to live up to as well. So. Yeah, of course. Mm. So you've given given us some tips now. What what would what be, would be your best tip for a startup trying to raise capital right now, if you were to give one? Well, I think to to begin with, you need to have a plan B if you're not able to raise capital right now. So take measures now to prolong your runway would be my advice. So you have options because uh, we have it's really hard to predict how hard it, it's going to be and it, it of course depends on the company and the business they're in um, but that's my first advice have have your plan B ready uh, so you have options and I guess that's a general advice whenever raising capital make sure you have plenty of time so you're not in a squeezed situation where you need to close within a certain you know two to three months because it's gonna take time um, you know, at least from from when you start fundraising to when you actually close. I mean, it can take anything from six to nine to 12 months in worst case scenario. Um, so be prepared that it's going to take time and you're going to have to meet with a lot of investors. But although, I mean, we're in the middle of a crisis, don't assume that people are not investing as well, because I've heard from angels I suddenly got, you know, a lot less deal flow because everyone was assuming angels are not investing, but there are a lot of the angels actually investing now as well. Uh, so uh, just go out there and try to get as many meetings as possible and be prepared to have a hundred meetings on, you know, one actually <laughs> going forward. So yeah, that's something to be prepared for, for sure. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, good advice, I think. Um, mm. Let's head over to some of the questions that we have received from our viewers. Um, here's the question. We are a startup of about 20 FTE. Uh, in today's cash burn, we can survive until early fall, fall 2021. However, however, if paying customers, paying customers start leaving us or choose to heavily downgrade their contract, we might need more fundraising. In worst case, what do you think of our chances of receiving funding during 2021? I think this is a really good question because this is something 
we've uh, debated with a lot of our portfolio companies as well. How are you going to be able to break at the same time you need to show growth to typically to be able to raise money? And how are you going to do those two things at the same time? And I think, yeah, I hope, however, that, I mean, investors will look at the traction and the growth you had before the crisis and will value the companies pulling through the crisis, getting through and coming out on the other side will, you know, be worth a lot. And if you had traction before the crisis and you still have an overall potential, where, as I said, we invest, I mean, a typical investor believes the exit will be maybe five or seven years down the line. And and of course, we should be able to look past this current crisis and look at the overall sort of business idea and business model if we believe in it. Um, so, um, well, hopefully that will weigh in so you uh, can see this as a sort of uh, exception, the crisis, and, and look at the longer, longer term. Yeah, let's hope for that. Hopefully. Yeah. But it's hard being able to break and, and accelerate at the same time. It's, it's probably really hard. Yeah. And I guess you might need to overlook your, your product messaging as well and make sure you adjust sort of your product marketing uh, and overall communication to the current crisis as well and try to be opportunistic if you can uh, so you can you know, get the best out of the current situation. Mm. Good advice again. Um, here's another one. Uh, we are a fintech startup planning for our next capital round. Uh, given the current situation, I think it's very hard to show a decent prognosis going forward. What level of security in prognosis are investor looking, investors looking for right now? I, I personally, and I think most investors, will have an understanding for the fact that all we know is that times are uncertain and forecasting will be very hard. Um, so I think, yeah, yeah, I think we will have a good understanding for temporarily, it will be really hard to guess uh, how the outcome and how long our sales cycles will be and what pipe generation will have at the moment. So um, as long as we believe in sort of the longer plan and we can show uh, evidence that the longer plan <laughs> will be um, attractive enough. I think that will be uh, the most important thing. Yeah. Um, on to the next one then. Uh, how important is a warm introduction versus a cold call to get funding? Well, personally, I think it's... I would like to think that it doesn't matter uh, too much that you get the right introduction, as long as you have, as I said, this, you know, unique insight and outstanding product with, with good traction in the market, uh, you, sh you should be able to get a meeting. However, I think in reality, it can matter, uh, at least to get that very first meeting. Um, maybe if you're a little bit earlier and you want, you know, a, a meeting, Greek meeting, uh, at least for me, yes, I would maybe be more inclined to take a meeting a little bit too early if it comes from someone I really trust. Uh, um, so yeah, uh, I hope it, if you have a really outstanding you know, business idea that you should be able to get the meeting anyway. But in reality, I think, yes, it can matter. Yeah. It can matter. Uh, a question related to that. Mm -hmm. uh, is, there an, mm -hmm. is there any one thing that would impress you in the first contact with a startup besides the idea itself? Um, well, of course, an outstanding product uh, living uh, with, you know, great sort of net promoter score or uh, um, great value added to the business. And um, yeah, product is I think really important to me and, and being able to show that the product adds enormous value to the customers using it. Um, that impresses me uh, as well as, as I said, really, really knowing your customer and knowing the market you're operating in. Um, that's also something that impresses me. Um, so you've actually really done your research on the customers and the market you're approaching. Yeah, mm. being well prepared and doing research is 
Yeah, it's always a good thing. Uh, and I guess the, the personality, uh, we talked to another one uh, about mm. this. Uh, if you can see that the person uh, really has a passion about it, maybe that's something that weighs in also. Um. Yes, I guess as a founder, you know, having a lot of grit and a lot of passion for what you're doing and really believing in the overall and having an overall vision of why you're doing something. Um, yeah. That matters, of yeah. course. Um, uh, for current current investments, does industry fund and have a culture of providing bridge capital uh, loans, etc., to a series obje of objective milestones to get a better point to raise the next round of financing? Yes, we do bridge rounds uh, sometimes. Um, with that said, I mean we always act. Um, as rational as we can, you know, trying to evaluate if we still believe in the overall sort of business idea and the market is still there and our customers are still there. If if all of those boxes are ticked, yes, we can do a bridge round uh, and might have to do a bridge rounds now to sort of get through this crisis. Mm. Yeah. Um, here's another one. Uh, how do I know if a fund has deployed its capital already when I talk to the investment managers? Sorry, repeat that again. Uh, how do I know if a fund has deployed its capital already uh, when I talk to the investment managers? Oh, you mean if they're fully invested? Yeah. I think that's something you can research quite easily. Um, if they still have funds or if they recently raised a new fund. Um, but yeah, of course, sometimes you, you might not know, but I guess if you were fully funded or fully invested in your fund, you might not take as many meetings, I guess. So. Hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. And this one, it, it touches upon some of the things you've already said, but mm. the repeating things is the best way to rem remember them as well. So when, when evaluating to invest in a startup, what, what are the most important criteria? When evaluating a startup? Yeah. Um, so I guess for us, it's the usual VC criteria um, that you need to have a unique insight of some sort or some sort of unfair advantage is something I talk about a lot. If it's with, you know, your own uh, innovative uh, patented technology, or if it's with your unique way of approaching a whole new business model or creating a new market, whatever it is, something that makes your business a little bit unique and gives you an unfair advantage. That's important. As well as the timing. The timing needs to be right. Uh, I think a lot of businesses have failed because you believe that the market is more mature, the customers are more ready than they actually are, uh, which uh, might lead to the sort of second mouse gets the cheese phenomena. Mm. <laughs> so that the timing is important, uh, as well as sort of the global potential needs to be there. Uh, and there needs to be a large, huge market. So um, you have the potential to generate a sort of at least 10x uh, return on our investment. Um, and then of course we need to have a team and founders that we believe in that are credible in what they're doing. So they have the right sort of experience and competence for what they're doing. That's important as well. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned the return expectations. Uh, the next question uh, is connected to that. What are your return expectations if we see an opportunity to, to sell for three times uh, and not 10 to 20 times return on your capital? Are you going to stand in the way of uh, this startup achieving their personal goals relative to you reaching your professional goals? Well, I guess if your personal goals is to be build a 3x business, then you shouldn't raise VC capital because uh, VC capital typically expect larger returns. I mean, the classic sort of Peter Thiel quote, I think, goes something along the lines that, you know, any single investment should be able to return your whole fund. Uh, I guess we're a little bit less extreme on that side because uh, we're you know, not a typical fund structure, but we still have the same sort of VC return expectations in terms of at least 10x and up uh, in five to seven years. Yeah. Um, 
And I guess that's an important point. I mean, not all companies build companies that are VC investable. And that's, you can build a really nice business um, and you should, you know, that doesn't have to raise capital. So sometimes I find that it's a little bit over, so ever, sometimes you meet companies thinking they need to raise VC capital, but it's not a VC kind of business. So that's something to know before you start raising. Is this actually a business that will attract, would be attractive to VC capital? Mm. Yeah, that's good to, to know mm. for yourself, mm. of course. Um, what's, uh, what is industry funders' view on impact startups? Uh, <laughs> yeah, overall, um, I believe that technology has the ability to solve most of our major challenges that we will face as a society going forward. And uh, I guess for me, that's what impact is trying to do as well. Um, with that said, I mean, we're not, um, we wouldn't invest in something if it didn't generate uh, VC returns. But we're a fund with an overall purpose to invest in things, making Sweden a little bit better, uh, making, helping our industry and economy with innovation and uh, making Sweden stronger in terms of being able to compete uh, globally. So I guess that's towards the impact side of things. So I'm all for um, impact investments and and think it's important and we will be able to solve some of the major challenges through impact and through technology. Um, you said that Industry Fonden invests in Serie A. Um, when would you recommend that the startup start a relationship with Industry Fonden? Um, I guess it's always good to start talking to investors when you actually have something to show, show for. And for us, we invest mostly in seed level, I should say, and occasionally we can do A rounds, but most commonly we invest uh, seed, late seed. Um, so you're still a fairly early company, but I prefer if you already have your product out there with customers using it, at least within the transformative tech uh, part of our investment uh, fund. We also do deep tech, and life science that switch. And there the logic is a little bit different. In deep tech, you have an enormous value maybe in the technology you've developed, then you have patents protecting your technology. So you might not need as much traction before, uh, you might not even have any traction actually, same in life science companies before talking to investors, because you have other things to show for. But I guess what you're saying before you start, because the time is, of course, a valuable resource source for everyone and for us as well. So make sure you have something to show before you start talking to investors. Uh, just just having an idea is too early. That's uh, good advice. And that's the final question. Our time has uh, run out. Is there something final would you would like to add to our, viewer, our viewers? Some final advice or anything? Before we uh, no, up. I guess a uh, uh, general wish and advice is that, I mean, what we saw in the dot com and I think in 2008, some of the greatest companies were founded during uh, times of crisis. So I'm hoping that uh, a lot of people, you know, maintain their courage to start great companies uh, and the companies going through the uh, coming through this crisis on the other side will, you know, be a lot stronger and have even better uh, ability to succeed, I think. Uh, so hopefully the chaos will create lots of new uh, opportunities and great companies. So I'm hoping everyone will pull, pull through, even though it might seem a little slow at the moment. Yeah, uh, that I think uh, we all hope uh, for, for the companies, big as yeah. small. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today and answering all these well, thank questions. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and thank you everyone for watching today and thank you for sending, out qu qu sending in questions. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Have a great day, Rebecca, and uh, stay thank safe you all. and have stay well. Have a great well. day. Have a great day. Bye-bye.